Good morning. Hopefully you know by now we are starting a new forum series on the book of Acts. And if you're like, oh no, I missed it. You didn't. <laughs> you missed the first two opportunities for the first session, but there's one more on Tuesday night on Zoom. The link's on the front page. And if you join us, one of the scenes that we get to in uh, the middle of the first chapter that always gets me is it's the, it's the scene where Jesus ascends into heaven, and it's the end of Jesus's earthly ministry. It's the, the final note, uh, right before he lifts off, and he's there with his disciples, and his disciples have been there for all of it, right? They've been there for three years of his ministry. They've heard him teach. They've watched him do miracles. Uh, they know him intimately walking all around the Holy Land. Uh, they've been through his uh, betrayal and his arrest and his trial and his crucifixion. And they spend about 40 days with him after his resurrection where he keeps appearing to them. And then here he is, the last moments before he lifts off the earth and hands the keys of the church off to them. And there they have a question for him, this last moment. And the question is, Lord... Is now the time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Like, is now the time you're going to kick out the Romans and allow us to, like, have our politics made over? And the look on Jesus' face at this moment just must have been like, are, are you kidding me? Three years? You, have I mentioned this in three years? In three, did Jesus ever talk about like, verily I say unto thee, and then I will kick the Romans out? Does he ever talk about that? Was that ever a thing? Never a thing. And so it's sort of like at this moment, you almost wonder if the disciples have just humored Jesus for three years. Like, yeah, 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 love your neighbor, yada, yada, yada. But when are you getting the Romans out? And to me, it's, you see that the disciples, these guys who have known Jesus better than anyone else, who knew all of his, like, you know, knew his voice, knew his walk, you know, could pick him out of a crowd of uh, hundreds, like they just knew him so intimately and yet, they got him so wrong. And so, the haunting thing about that is, it's then not, the question isn't, do you think, think maybe perhaps sometimes we might get him wrong? The question is, when do we get him wrong? Because if they are able to get him this wrong, and they know him intimately, then when do we get him wrong? When do we just make assumptions? Those disciples obviously just went around with the assumption that, yeah, eventually this, he's going to get around to kicking the Romans out. Obviously. If you look back in uh, the history of the church the last 2,000 years, there are other things that we just took as obvious for a long time. We Christians believe that the earth was flat, And not just because the scientists at that time told us that, but we believe that because it seemed obvious in Scripture. The Scriptures talk about the foundations of the earth. It's hard to have a foundation on a floating, spinning orb going through space. So they just obviously imagined the earth as flat disk set upon something firm and unmovable until we realized, oh, that's not how it works. And then the next thing was obvious, was obviously the sun revolves around us. And not just because the scientists tell us that, but because it seems obvious from Scripture. There's a scene where um, the Israelites are at war uh, with the, the, the Philistines, um, and Joshua raises his arms and to, to keep things going, keep, to keep the day going because they're winning the war. And the, the story says the sun stopped in the sky. It doesn't say then the earth stops spinning on its axis. And so 
we people of faith looked at that and said, obviously, the sun's moving. We aren't, so the sun must go around us, obviously, until we round, found out we were wrong. I mean, there were the slavery in the American South wasn't just something that like helped prop up economies. There were faithful people who read their scriptures, their Bibles, who said the slavery is in the Bible. It seems like God regulates slavery. God doesn't seem to condemn slavery. So obviously, religiously, slavery must be okay until we realize that no, and I, I hope now it's like unanimous that we realize that slavery is wrong, both economically and spiritually, right? There are things that we hold to be obvious and that our forebearers have held to be just like obviously this is how the world works or how the world should work and we know those things not to be the case. Which brings me to today's gospel lesson where Jesus uh, has just begun his ministry. We're still in the first chapter of Mark. The first person that Jesus heals in Mark's gospel is Peter's mother-in-law. And uh, obviously the word got out that uh, she was healed, and so that's a big deal. And so everyone else in town is like, oh, I've got, I've got an ailment. Like, I gotta... So they all start coming out and surrounding um, Peter's mother-in-law's home, wanting Jesus to heal them. And uh, Mark tells us the whole town was there. Like, even people who didn't have stuff made up stuff. Like, everyone's coming to get something healed. And... Uh, and he heals about half of them. And then what does he do? I mean, what's the obvious Jesus thing to do? There's people in need. There's people hurting. So Jesus heals them, right? It's the obvious Jesus thing to do. Jesus is obviously going to stay there until he has met the needs of every person there, right? It's the obvious thing. Except not what Jesus does. Jesus leaves. And not because he has got a, an emergency, not like he got like a text and he's like, oh, I got something big. He leaves to go off to a deserted place to pray. He's only just started his ministry. It's not like he's been doing this for, been on tour for six months and he's like exhausted. He just started and he's already like, you know, I'm going to go take some, take some me time. Take some time with, uh, with my father in prayer. And so, uh, obviously, the disciples are back there. The people are around the house. And so, who are the people talking to? The disciples. They are obviously putting pressure on the disciples. Like, when's Jesus getting back? Do you see this little girl? She needs healed. You see this old guy? He needs healed. You see those people over there? They need healed. Where's Jesus? And they're like, I don't know where Jesus is. He's probably off doing something really important. And so they go off to find him. And you can hear the anxiety in their voices when um, they finally find him. The first words out of their mouth is, everyone is looking for you. You ever have someone come to you say that? <laughs> it's, not, it's not a good like Monday morning, 9.15 a.m. Like, everyone's looking for you. Oh, no. So they get there. Everyone's looking for you. There's half a town that still needs healed. The disciples are freaked out because the pressure is on them. So obviously, what does Jesus do? Obviously. People in need, what does Jesus do? He goes back, right? Goes back to town, finds all the people that are looking for him, and he heals them all, right? Except it's not what he does. It's not what he does. He goes, let's go on to another town. I got other work to do there. I, uh, Fridays are my day off. Uh, I try and um, not work on Fridays. Um, Karen thinks that still means I have to work around the house, but that's our own argument uh, <laughs> that we go through. But um, I try not to do church work on Fridays. I try to just like do me and in the family. And, but if the senior warden 
called me on Friday morning and said, Rick, there's a line of people out the St. Mark's doors, down the street, looking for you, needing a priest. What am I going to do? I'm going to jump off the couch, I'm going to put on real clothes, and I'm going to run out here and try and meet people's needs. Because obviously that's the Jesus thing to do. Except when it obviously isn't. Jesus seems to prioritize rest, solitude, prayer. When people come to him with all kinds of anxiety, like people are looking for you, they need you, they need to do this, he doesn't pick up that anxiety. He's like, that's not mine. Jesus doesn't feel like he has to do it all. He's like, I got other things to do. I'm going to go off and do that. And that sounds weird and it feels like the un-Jesus thing, the un-Bible thing, until you go back and you start the Bible from the beginning. And the first story, the very first story of the Bible, is God doing six things. And then the seventh thing that he does is he goes off and rests and doesn't do any work. God needs a nap. Or maybe he doesn't need it, but he takes it. And then God takes that seventh day rest that he had, and he turns it around to his people and says, you are now going to take a rest every seven days. In fact, we're going to put it in a list of commandments, not suggestions, and we're going to put it at number four. The fourth thing you're going to do is every day you're going to take a day off, and you're not going to do work. In fact, you're going to do nothing productive at all. And we're going to put that like right next to like, so you don't murder people. Okay. You take a day off. Okay. And you have to remember that this is totally new on the world stage. When God gives these laws to the Jewish people, there is not another nation on earth who takes a regular day off. It's not a thing. Every day is a work day. Every day is a day of survival. Every day is a day of trying to get more crops out of the ground and put them away so that you don't starve in the next famine. Every day is like yesterday, and every day is like the day that is coming. Israel is the one nation that takes a day off because God said, you do this. It's, God says that work is not the most important thing that you do. Yes, you're going to work. You work, work, work for six days, but then you will take a day off. And then he even expands that to say it's not just the seventh day, but he'll talk about the seventh year, the Sabbath year. And on that year, no agriculture is going to happen, which means that we're going to let the, the land rest and build up nutrients again. But it also means all of the workers, they get a rest year as well. And then there's this further law where you get the seventh of seven years. So you get the 49th year is a major day of rest. It's the year of Jubilee. And not only do you not work, but you don't have to work to pay off your debts because on the 49th year, all your debts are wiped away. God just builds into the story of his, how he sets up the nation of Israel rest. My people are not going to be just drones going from day to day, like, I gotta make the donuts, gotta make the donuts. Some of you might be too young for that reference, but you get the idea. There is more to life than just going, going, going. And part of the reason why, I think, if you let this story of today of Jesus healing some people and then leaving to pray and then leaving entirely, if you let the weirdness of that sink in, you understand that the obvious Jesus thing to do isn't to burn yourself out. The obvious thing to do is to do what you can, but also prioritize rest and solitude and prayer to put, not just pick things up, 
but to put them down. When, when God made us, God did not make us to function 24-7, 365. If we do that to ourselves, we start to break down. We start to break down physically. We start to break down emotionally. Like when, when your car manufacturer made your car, your car manufacturer expects you to change your oil every so often. You do change your oil, right? You can do that too. Um, unless you have a Tesla. And then you don't have to change your oil. Uh, but if you, if you have a normal car, uh, uh, you gotta change your oil. And if you don't change your oil, it's not like your car like breaks a little bit. Your whole engine goes. We're like a Tesla. You don't have to put oil in us, but you do have to let us recharge. We need it. It is required. And honestly, if you don't take it, your body will give it to you whether you want it or not. And you'll find yourself in the cardiac care unit. Some of you might be saying, well, that's not me anymore because uh, I'm retired. So I don't, I don't go to work nine to five. I don't have a cubicle. And awesome. But I would also say some of the busiest people I know are my friends who are retired. Uh, you might say, like, I, hey, I have really good boundaries and I take my days off and I take my vacations and I take time every morning and every night to pray and that's awesome, it's awesome, excellent. And perhaps your work is not to find more ways for yourself to rest, but perhaps to give permission to other people. Hey, don't do that. Why are you doing that? Put that down. That's not for yours. That's not for you to pick up. It looks like you need some rest. Can I take something off your plate to help you with yours? God made us and set up our society not to be taskmasters, not to be task doers, not to just go, 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 but God made us so that we could have time to connect with each other and connect with him. And we do, and when we do, not only are we living a more spiritual life, but our life is just better. So don't do what you assume is the Jesus thing to do. Do what Jesus actually does. Amen.